we see it bailouts all the time for big companies that make mistakes and so that that's really part of the issue we should have had a you know black swan event of some kind probably 20 years ago i think they almost are resistant to the idea of something replacing their paper money because they perceive that that changeover is going to have a lot of you know suffering and bad times along with it maybe it will maybe it won't maybe it needs to justin nazaroff is the founder of phoenix ammunition a Michigan-based company known for manufacturing high-quality ammunition tailored for competitive shooters and firearm enthusiasts. The company prides itself on its commitment to quality and innovation in ammunition production while promoting self-sovereignty by accepting Bitcoin payments. That's the way that I think that they view Bitcoin is, you know, anything that can get around the government's ability to restrict what you can do or say they view as essentially a weapon. So then what are your choices? You can go buried in the yard or you can have them come literally kill you and take your AR-15 from your cold dead hands, but then you're dead and they have your AR-15. But in the world of Bitcoin, you know, as long as you can remember 12 words in your head, they can literally beat you to death and they will never get your Bitcoin. If you are headstrong enough to be able to resist that and say, you know what, I'm going to take this Bitcoin to my grave, guys. Um, even if you kill me, you're not going to get it from me. So it is what it is. To me, that's beautiful. Mr. Justin Nazaroff, thank you so much for joining me here today. Justin is the owner of Phoenix Ammunition based here in Novi, Michigan, right down the road from me, actually. And uh, you, sir, are a very polarizing figure. You are known for putting the memes uh, on your bags of ammunition and accepting Bitcoin for purchases, yeah. which those two things will not make Among you, other things, yes. Yeah, will not make <laughs> you extremely popular in the modern world we live in, unfortunately. Uh, but among those other things as well is teaching some self-custody and running your own node. Uh, so thank you truly yeah. for walking the talk and being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so first off, what where do you... Where do you, you know, we have to kind of ask the, the 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 question outside of what people see right behind you, which we'll obviously get to here. But just Bitcoin, where you kind of see things in general, there's obviously, you know, people have always the, the speculation, not not price necessarily, but where do you kind of see things going in this bull run over the next like year or two? And in really, I guess this decade, just in the macro. Sure. Well, I mean, I think <clears throat> getting even beyond like bull runs and what have you. Uh, you know, I really like the way that Michael Saylor explained Bitcoin. Um, I, I've listened to pretty much everything that he's had to say, and I, I think he has a great way of breaking down sort of the evolution of money technology, if you will. Um, you know, he compared it to we went from the written word to being able to, say, record, you know, songs on an eight track or on a you know a cassette tape all the way to the digitization of um, resources in terms of like music and technology. And he more or less explained that he sees Bitcoin as being the same thing, the digitization of money. And to me, that really made it all make sense. You know, eventually you're going to go from a, a physical, tangible paper object uh, or, you know, gold, I would say, you, you know, you could say would be the origin and then to paper money. And um, that, you know, removed removed you further from being able or from requiring you to carry around and divvy up gold bars um, makes it easier to do trade and commerce. And so then obviously the next evolution being the digitization of money. You know, I think a lot of people feel like money is already is already digitized in the sense that, you know, you can send an ACH transfer to somebody and it shows up or, um, you know, a wire transfer and the money just appears in your account. But in reality, all of the back end systems that exist uh, behind that are, are the things that are, you know, at, at best 30, 40 years old in some cases. And all of that is captured by these gigantic conglomerate companies that we are beholden to in order to accept a credit card or even an, an ACH or, or a wire transfer. So being able to move away from those things to the point where people can actually do, you know, person to person transactions without having to have a third party intermediary in place. That really made sense to me, especially being in, in the in the business that I am, where people are, you could say, a little more 
wary about uh, people knowing what they're up to with their money and what they're buying and, you know, how many guns they own or how much ammo they're purchasing, um, all those things. So it, it, to me, it's just the natural evolution and, uh, you know, it's going to have to move in that direction. And Bitcoin seems to be the one that has the most headway. It, it's sort of the original technology, um, unlike most of the other tokens and coins. Um, it's not, you know, a corporation or a, a, essentially a stock in a corporation in, in, in a sense. Um, so I've been high on it more or less since I first heard about it. I, you know, it was many years before I really got involved with it. And um, really only until I started this company uh, did I really understand it fully and, and the power of it. But, I mean, look at the evolution of, of AI. People are already believing that that's going to change the world. And we're only, what, two, three years into uh, into that technology. And it, it may take 10 or 20 years to fully realize the the benefits of AI. I mean, look, if you look at the Internet, for example, you know, the, we had the, uh, the Internet, the dot-com boom in the late 90s. But it really wasn't until probably late 2000s where you really started to see the Internet come into its full form um, in terms of being able to access information and and really be accessible to everybody and be a, a useful tool for business and education, um, finance, all those things. So when you consider that Bitcoin is what, um, you know, a little over a decade old, you have another 10 years for it to advance. Look at the Internet in, you know, the year 2000 compared to what it is today. And just imagine what that will be in the Bitcoin world. So I think holding it back right now is, you know, just the general public understanding. I would say, um, you know, the the apps being able to actually use it for commerce is, is mm-hmm. the thing that's holding it back. And I know that there's a lot of people working on various technologies, the Lightning Network, uh, and things like that to make it easier to to use, um, but it, we're only you know 10 or 11 years in so um, i'm very high on it uh, to to put it mildly how is it revolutionized your business i'd love for you to kind of walk through just you know you starting you know the the company you have now and and how it's revolutionized or kind of or even how you see it continuing to yeah. revolutionize your business yeah uh i it hasn't quite revolutionized it yet but right away i i recognized a problem even in the first few months of starting this company, setting up the website, trying to, you know, I, I mostly have done all of that in house. So a lot of it was me learning on the back end. Okay. How, how do we, how do you accept a credit card? Okay. Well, I need a credit card processor. Okay. Um, who else is involved in that? You guys are charging me a percentage fee to run credit cards. You know, who does that money go to? When, when I get into something, I tend to get into it to level 10. I, I want to know everything about it. Uh, I want to research it to death. And so, you know, very quickly I realized, number one, there's only one or two credit card processors that I'm even able to work with in the gun industry because none of the others will. Um, Stripe, Square, PayPal, you know, even Venmo and Cash App put us in the same category as gambling and pornography and, you know, selling drugs that may or may not be legal in your state. So, uh, that was always mystifying to me, but I just, I knew there was nothing I could do about it. I can't call up MasterCard and, you know, or Bank Corp and, and read them the riot act and try to get them to see, you know, my side of, of the story. So of course, being in the two way space and, and in, in that mindset, you always think, well, what happens when they just turn us off one day and they decide they don't want to work with us. And that's happened to many people in the gun industry, not just on credit card processing, but just web hosting, um, all kinds of things. So uh, that was always in the back of my mind in the first year or two of getting the website going was, all right, what's my backup plan? You know, how do we figure out a way around this? People don't really want to have their purchases tracked, um, but, you know, the credit card companies are thinking about, you know, putting special tags on ammo and firearm purchases. Uh, they're talking about limitations, you know, where do we go from here? And so that was right around 2018 and, and that 17, 18, that kind of happened to coincide with a you know bull run with Bitcoin where it was getting up to 20,000, I think at the time, which is funny to think about now. So 
uh, as all that's going on and, you know, all my friends are texting me, oh, you got to buy Bitcoin, you know, blah, 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 you know, download this app, check what it is today. So I thought, all right, well, maybe I should start looking into this from a, a business perspective. It seems that this is a way around the credit card processors and these third party banks. So let's start, let's start doing some initial research. And, you know, that leads to finding a, a plugin for the website. Okay, now we can accept Bitcoin. Okay. Um, now I have to manage a whole nother currency on my books, which is a, a small problem. But now that we can accept it, how, how do we how do we divorce it even further from, you know, the, a, the control of some other party being able to you know, prevent me from accepting that as a as a legal tender? So then you get into, all right, well, how do I run my own node? How do I have full self custody in a wallet that's outside of this plugin app that I need to accept the coins on my site? You know, what do I do with it then? Um, and then from the marketing perspective of, well, again, this is a space where, you know, people, people want to be people, people want, people don't want their, their purchases to be tracked. And they want to be giving out as little information as possible. So here's a way that we can differentiate ourselves from the market by saying, look, we're, we are actively right now. We, we can't quite make you anonymous, but we are working as hard as we can every day to think up of new ideas to try to get to that point where you are as anonymous as possible. And I realized right away, there's not a whole lot of acceptance in the gun space because it, I guess I'm not really sure why, you know, technology people uh, tend to be in their own lane. Gun people tend to be in their other lane. And surprisingly, there's not as much crossover between the two as you would think, even though deep down at their core, uh, those two communities have a lot in common. And I used to think the same thing about uh, the marijuana industry and the, the gun industry. And for a lot of the same problems, they have issues accepting credit cards, um, even in states where uh, it's legal to purchase marijuana. And maybe they don't maybe they don't really have anything in common with gun rights people, aside from the fact that they believe that they should be able to do what they want, um, you know, from a victimless crime standpoint, that they should be able to be left alone. So do we. And both of us have a problem accepting credit cards and being worried about dealing with banks in the future. And so uh, they're looking for ways around it. And we're also looking for ways around it. And then here's these Bitcoin people that may not have anything in common, but it's like a, you know, a, a three circle Venn diagram. There's that middle section where, you know, there's people who are into guns, there's people who are into marijuana. Again, like whether you like that or not, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's just uh, the, the nature of, uh, of, the, of the market. And then there's also people who are into Bitcoin. And if we can expand the middle circle of that Venn diagram, at least between Bitcoin and guns, you know, again, setting marijuana aside, if that's not your thing, then that's good for everybody. Because if we have three different markets all working toward the same, working on the same problem, then the chances are we're going to be able to find a solution that works for everybody uh, much quicker, just more resources available. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, what What do you think? Obviously, it makes me think of Operation Choke Point. It was something I already yeah. had written down to talk to you about briefly, and I, you kind of touched on that a little bit and, and indirectly. But what What do you think is holding business owners? Because, like again, you you outlined it beautifully, and whether it's you know very little to no fees using Bitcoin and things of that nature, how how is it not spread? That's what I don't get. Like, how do as a business owner, I, I'll go to a convenience store and I'll say, hey, you guys accept Bitcoin and I'll go in there over and over again. And they're like, no, no, no. You know, like eventually yeah. sometimes that all ask, but it's like, how do you not? And it's like, well, you don't no credit card fees, no whatever. And it's like, how do right. someone, how does someone not take on to that right away? Even that fact alone. I mean, what, what have you seen? Like even in, in the two a uh, world where people might not be willing to, or what have, what's been your. Um, sure. I, I think, I think it's twofold. I think right now the technology is still new on in, in terms of, how to actually accept Bitcoin uh, and and do small transactions between, like like you said, at like a convenience store or something like that. Um, I think there's still barriers to entry where your average convenience store owner just says, "Well, you know, how many Bitcoin transactions am I going to make per month?" Uh, versus the cost of implementing a solution that's easy for your average $15 an hour gas station clerk to just deal with. And I think 
that's the biggest issue right now with Bitcoin is, you know, it's very easy to get set up with a credit card processor and you get yourself a little uh, pin terminal for your store. And yeah, you're paying 3% or whatever it is, but it's very seamless. It's very easy. You just set it up and plug it in and it works. And the guy comes in and sticks his card in the reader and that's all that you need to do. There's no there's no fussing about uh, with the back end of the technology. So I think that's the biggest issue is we just don't have the right hardware and software solutions right now. Um, there, there's no company that's really put the effort into that that I think is required to get widespread acceptance from the general public and people in small businesses uh, to be able to work with it on a on a day to day basis. And then I think also just the general public knowledge of, of how it works. You know, people are very resistant to change, especially when you're talking about money. You know, it's one thing if you invested in, you know, HD DVD instead of Blu-ray, like, OK, you can chalk it up to I'm going to throw out this HD DVD player that I overpaid for. And I'm going to have to go buy this Blu-ray, but it's two years later, so it's 39 bucks and who, who the fuck cares, right? It just, it, it is what it is. But, you know, when you're talking about people, especially, you know, middle America, where it's not like they have um, a huge amount of money in their checking account to just play around with. And, well, you know, I put, I bought some Bitcoin and it's kind of like floating around in cyberspace and I got it in this cold storage wallet and I, I don't, I don't really know it's there, but they say it's there and supposedly it's there. But if I want to, you know, get actual dollars for it, I still got to go to like Coinbase or something like that. So there's just a lot of steps in the process. And I mean, you know, I worked in the insurance industry for 10 years before this. And one of our primary um, products for that company was 401k plans. And even something as simple as a, an employee 401k plan, you know, your average guy working in a machine shop, let's say he's making 70 or 80 grand a year. He's putting 3% into his 401k so he can get his employee match. So he's putting away like 6% of his income in, per year into this stock fund that he never logs into. He hardly ever makes any changes. Of, and I mean, like I, la I used to laugh about it. It's like, man, how these people, you know, how are they so stupid? Like, don't they care about their retirement? But the reality is like, dude, this guy's got three kids. He's got a job. He's got to take his kids to soccer practice. He's got to, you know, fix the, the door on the shed this weekend and things just fall to the wayside. And so, but he can log into his, um, you know, bank account app on his phone and check his balance real quick. He can move money around. He can pay bills. And so I think that's really what's the, I, I'm, I'm 39. So I exist in a space where I had a cell phone when I was 14, but you know, it had 200 minutes a month. I wasn't allowed to call anybody except for my parents. <laughs> you know, like you, you could barely send text messages. Um, but my father's a computer engineer. So we had a computer in our house when I was maybe eight years old, which is very uncommon at the time. And so I've experienced the, you know, going from, you know, 56K modems up to modern, you know, 5G broadband, Starlink, all this stuff. And I think I'm, I'm, I would say like the millennial generation is probably the first generation that's really going to be able to accept and use and work with Bitcoin on a daily basis and not be so overwhelmed and, and not have to suffer from, you know, teaching old dogs new tricks kind of an issue. Um, so I think part of it is just a matter of time. But but that's the other, the other issue is just, you know, public acceptance of new technology. Um, especially when it comes to money and banking, it's going to be a very, very slow uh, rate of acceptance versus, you know, a consumer product of some kind where they can make a mistake and it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I, boy, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I think that it, it really is. You know, what's the, it's like the old saying of like science progresses one funeral at a time, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> like it's, it just, that's what it is. And it's like the only other thing I can think of and is it's a massive event that happens, right? Like it just humans sure. just, they tend to have really struggle, like you said, with change, especially when it comes to money. But even when all the signs are there, everything is there. I mean, they're in a bar fight, they've got hit 10 times in the face and they still don't know they're in a bar fight. You know, it's just like, at what yeah. point do you realize like, oh shit, I should probably get my hands up or either run or get my hand right. or something until I'm on the floor bleeding out. And it's just like, what, what are we doing here? So it just, 
a massive event. Yeah, uh, I think nuclear. part part of the problem know. is you know after the creation of the Federal Reserve and now we can just print unlimited money. You know, and there's mm -hmm. we see a bailouts all the time for big companies that make mistakes, and so that that's really part of the issue. We we should have had a you know black swan event of some kind probably 20 years ago you know i mean back i back in the gm bailouts you know or or even or way way before that but because you can just print up another trillion dollars we keep delaying that from happening in a natural sense uh and and now we've made people so afraid of it happening that I think they almost are resistant to the idea of something replacing their paper money because they perceive that that changeover is going to be uh, is going to have a lot of you know suffering and bad times along with it. And maybe it will, maybe it won't, maybe it needs to. But your average person doesn't really want to do that. You know, as much as we as we in the two A community, you have people talking about the boogaloo and the civil war and all that, and it's like, man, guys. First of all, none of you really want that, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, go look at any country that's been through a civil war. Like, you really do not want that. And number two, you really have no idea what that's going to look like. And I think that's what people perceive a change in the money system would bring. You know, some sort of a major collapse. Uh, Fifty percent of the population is dead. You know, nobody can get food. All those kinds of things. So. Um, you people are a little unwilling to get out of the box and look around. Um, yeah, that, that's amazing. That's, that's so well said. Big problem I can see. That yeah, it's so well said. Um, have you had problems specifically, or I guess I mean maybe some people you know with um, Operation Choke Point and just doing that? I know you you touched on it a little bit, but what do you, what are you? What server do you use? What pay um, pay server do you use? And um, are you, you know, using Starlink to run stuff? Like how, how outside the box have you had to go? So um, we really haven't dealt with anything as far as Operation Choke Point's concerned. That sort of predated us a little bit. That was, you know, like an Obama era mm -hmm. thing that kind of carried over a little bit. Um, and it, it received a lot of, you know, political pushback. So they, they kind of tabled that for a while. You know, like I said, we, we didn't see personally any, um, particular issues uh, with their with, with that in, but it, it's definitely led people in the in the two A space to kind of be put on notice. It's like, well, if they're telling us that they could be doing this, they're probably already doing it. Let's be honest, and they've probably been doing it for a decade, and they weren't telling us. So um, the idea that all of a sudden they're getting some bad press and that they're going to stop is pretty laughable. They're just going to find a way to do it that we can't see or that, you know, is, is easier, harder, harder for us to, to track uh, in the general public. I mean, people in the 2A space already believe that the ATF is digitizing everybody's uh, serial numbers and 4473 forms, and they are doing that. In some cases, that's been proven. So, um, you know, they're almost assuredly already doing that to some degree that we don't really know about. Um, what was the second part? I'm sorry, I missed the uh, about the server. The yeah, what what you're using to accept Bitcoin? <clears throat> sure. So we right now are using BTC Pay. Um, <clears throat> we are we are not running our own server. It is on a hosted server, but it's uh, it's a it's a secure server that that we're we're happy with. Um, we have thought about running our own server. Um, you know that that comes with some technology issues that on a day to day basis. I'm, I'm not an IT guy and we don't have an IT guy. So I've, I've been sort of uh, reluctant to stick my toe in that water uh, mm. unless I, I know it's something that I can set up and walk away from and have just work uh, and not have to worry about. But um, yeah, we're using BTC pay server. Uh, we're running it on a, a uh, Samurai Dojo uh, node. And uh, I also have, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ronin Dojo node. And um, I have one of those also at my house. Um, a couple of my employees have them as well. I actually got, got them nodes as a Christmas gift nice. uh, three years ago. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. I, I mean, I feel like it, it does like society. 
I mean, I'll say this. I mean, I'm, I'm two years younger than you. So we, we grew up in the same era. And, I, you know, like if you asked me 20 years ago, uh, I mean, I thought the country, I was like, man, we're lost. I was like, there's going to be a civil war in our lifetime. Yeah. Like there's no way. And people are so completely lost. They thought and they believed everything the media said and on and on and on. And just the, the change that's happened really even just in the last five years, but the last, you know, five, 10, 15 years since the GFC will say, has been unbelievable. I mean, you've got people, prominent, prominent people, Russell Brands were crying out loud, people that were like leftist right. almost. And now they're like talking, you know, conspiracy theories the so, whole time, which we know are just, you know, pre preludes to what actually gets correct. we find out, right? Exactly. But it's like, it, I mean, just to see how much has shifted. I mean, does that give you hope? I mean, to me, I'm like, dude, I've got, we got people out there with millions of followers doing our work now. Like that, I, yeah. I, you know, I felt very alone 20 years ago, even as a kid being very political. Um, how do you, how do you see things? I mean, I, hopefully you share the same sentiment. You see the same thing. Cause I'm like, man, this is wild. Yeah, I do. I think Twitter's playing a big role in that. Um, mm -hmm. just the, the proliferation of social media technology while horrible in a lot of ways, has connected groups of people that might never otherwise uh, have anything in common or be able to talk to each other. And so, yeah, you're seeing, you know, like a little personal anecdote, you know, I, I, uh, I do a number of things. I'm a black belt in jujitsu. Uh, I, I lift weights, but I also do hot yoga a couple days a week. And the place I do it at, uh, I live, uh, as you probably know, in Oakland County, which is extremely liberal uh, and the studio I train at is in a very liberal area. And I would say probably 95% of the people who, who train there are, are uh, moderately to very liberal. However, I have had many conversations over the last six to eight months with people who I thought um, I, I would have maybe nothing in common with. And you start talking to them a little bit about you know, they ask you what you do and, and, you know, what you do in your free time. And so I talk about, you know, I've been doing jujitsu for 20 years. You know, I, I know all about self-defense. I, I teach it for a living practically. And oh, by the way, I also am in the firearms industry. And so I see it from that perspective where, um, you know, I won a world championship in 2015. And even with all that skill and training, you uh, all that stuff, there's always somebody bigger, there's always somebody stronger, there's always somebody faster, there's always somebody that knows more. And that's why I carry a gun. Um, so you see the wheels start turning in their head a little bit when you have those conversations where you're talking to a group of predominantly women about self-defense and we're talking about teaching a women's self-defense class. And then you start talking about firearms and you see the wheels turning and, and they say, oh, yeah, that is you're right. That's a, that's a great idea. Maybe I should look into that. Yeah. And so even though we may disagree on almost everything else, uh, you can start to slowly uh, red pill them on things that make sense from their perspective. And then maybe you have conversations later on about other topics and you can kind of wade your way in there. So um, I would say on Twitter, I'm not the best at that. I'm, I'm better with ridicule and humiliation and, you know, uh, being very condescending and, and, and uh, those kinds of things. But, I, you know, I tried, I, tried to, I tried to use those two personalities where I see them best fit. And, you know, Twitter, for all the things it's great at, it's not great at changing people's minds. You know, you only have a certain amount of characters to do it in. So you got to squeeze your point in there and then you got to squeeze in some kind of little like retort or reply. And it just never really seems to go anywhere in person. You know, that's I, I feel like I could sit down uh, and have dinner with just about anybody. And by the end of it, can convince them that they should probably own a gun. So I think uh, it, it's been great to see some of the bigger celebrities, people who were traditionally left coming out and starting to support positions that are I mean, really more moderate and libertarian than anything else. But you know, gun ownership, especially with everything that's going on around the world, seems to be something that even people on the, on the left are seeing uh, the importance of. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, so well said. I couldn't agree more. There's a perfect segue into where did you get the idea? Because like, I, I couldn't agree more. One of my favorite Bitcoin shows is The Breakup with Noam Bowerly, one of my friends, yeah. and he right? And he, it's just, it's constant contrast, right? It's ridicule, it's shame, it's uh, contrast. Um, where did you get the idea 
to to really join the meme space and and be putting these on the ammo bags i mean if you know yeah. I, it's like where did you get this idea it's one of the best things i've ever seen <laughs> yeah well so it kind of happened by happenstance but you know going going back before that like i said i'm a, I'm a millennial i grew up on forums and message boards you know i'm a car guy i'm a i'm a you know combat sports guy so I've been on, you know, every forum that you could imagine. And that's just like how you grew up. You know, you asked a question and you expected somebody to ridicule you first and then maybe answer the question. <laughs> and it's just a lot of back and forth. And, you know, again, I, I'm not a video game player, but I'm sure if you are or anybody who's listening is, you can remember what, you know, the Call of Duty chats looked like before things got like woke and crazy, you know, just the most ridiculous things ever. So like it or not that's just the era that i grew up in and so now you get on twitter and it's like man you know this is like a message board for the entire world it's not just people who are involved in this particular activity that i like this is everybody and so you can make this what you want and it, so i saw right away the gun space while they tend companies tended to do a lot of say posturing and acting tough and you know we're the gun industry and blah 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 at the end of the day, none of them are really all that outspoken. And that's because the majority of their revenue is coming from military and law enforcement and government contracts. And so, uh, and they're old companies that have been around forever. They have HR departments, they have shareholders, um, all these things. And so they're very limited on what they can say. Uh, they don't want the blowback. They don't want to get contracts canceled. Uh, so I saw an opportunity for a company that doesn't have any of those things for better or for worse where we're a very small niche within a niche. And so let's try to build that out as best we can. And what I keep hearing from everybody in all of the shooting communities that I'm involved in, competitive shooting, you know, training and what have you, they're all saying, man, I, I really wish Glock would wake up one day and just tell the government to fuck off. And it's like, well, they're never gonna do that. So maybe I can do that. And again, I'm 39, I'm, I'm, I'm younger relative to most of the other business owners in this space. Uh, with much larger, more well-established companies. So I just said, you know, I, I like to talk trash. Um, you know, like I said, been in combat sports forever. You know, I'm not, I'm not afraid. I've literally been beat up. Um, you can go on the internet and see a video of me like getting beat up if you want. Um, but there's plenty of videos of me beating up other people as well. So I'm just generally not really afraid of what people think about me, or uh, I'm not afraid of getting beat up. So you know. I can pretty much say whatever I want and within reason, of course, uh, and get away with it. So let's try to do that and see what people like. And sure enough, people loved it. And so as we got, uh, as we, as we made some changes to the way we were packaging our product and that's how the memes came about. You know, we, we have an automatic bag printer and we were playing around with it one day and we found that there was a big open space that we could print, you know, pretty much whatever we wanted. And so, we thought, OK, let's try to put some funny messages in there. And then we figured out how to print um, basic photos and pictures. And so then it's off to the races and you say, all right, well, you know, aside from like getting literally banned on the Internet for saying something completely atrocious, like what's the how can we push that edge about as far as we can go? And you just know that you can print something even really non-controversial. Uh, you can criticize a politician like everybody in America should be doing uh, all the time but they just really get caught up on the idea that that criticism is printed on a bag of ammo. And to me, I just say, well, that's your problem. Sorry, I, you know, if I was in the nuts and bolts industry and it was a bag of nuts and bolts, I would be printing the same exact thing on there and maybe you wouldn't have a problem with that. But the fact that it's printed on a bag of ammo, that's your problem. If you don't like it, um, you know, it's my company. If you think it's a stupid idea and you think it's going to tank it, tank the company, then just let me die and see what happens. But um, they know that that's not what's going to happen. And so, you know, we actually got um, we got investigated by the Michigan Campaign Finance Board because they claimed that uh, we we supported the recall of a particular uh, politician around this area. And they were trying to claim that us printing uh, any messages regarding the recall effort was a, basically a campaign finance violation um, because they were convinced that we were being paid to do it or this and that. And so, um, you know, they will do 
anything that they can. You know, meanwhile, it's like how, how much how much fraud and corruption is happening in campaign finance? Like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, like there's just tr millions of dollars disappear every year for these, uh, you know, Soros money going to like some local DA. And it's like, Jesus Christ, you know, we, we printed uh, couple hundred bags with recall so-and-so on it and and like that's what's getting investigated like get the fuck out of here this is just this is but that's america you know it, the people who are uh the, the 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 larger you break the law the more likely you are to get away with it i think is is yeah the unfortunate truth of it yeah 100 percent. it's it is wild. I mean, yeah, especially, you know, you and I being in Michigan, if, if people have not been in Michigan before, I mean, the roads are always like the talk here, right? But it's like how much, how much money is being laundered through the, through the road, you know, initiatives and sit, I mean, it's just like, it's a joke. And it's just like, you can only imagine. And then they're coming, yeah. like you said, after little, like these little things just to make it look like they're doing something or because it's, they want to make an example, right? Like we don't like right. that. It's anti anti government which is something recently I saw some few people coming after you. It's like you're anti government and blah 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 blah. I'm mean, like, yeah, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Yeah. Like you haven't figured that out. Why aren't you? Is my question. Uh, like <laughs> you're you're pro government. I mean, I, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure why you would be. I, I just like oh, me, tell show me one area where government is making a difference uh, in a in a tangible way that couldn't be done by private industry. Or, or couldn't be being done 100% more efficient than what it's being done, even if they are making progress on something. Uh, so yeah, th those people, I think, like, you know, non-playable characters, that's basically yeah. the, the only way to, to describe them. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly why we call the show playable characters, because you only have yeah. playable characters on your <laughs> folks. Right, right. People like an actually thing. What, have you read um, uh, Jason Lowry's uh, book, the software book? or any or got into that at all with, i haven't uh, no what's that about so he he's in that you'll have to check it out and it's a it's a huge the i wish i had it i don't think i have it here um and it's uh, it's a big thesis he wrote at mit and published like a year ago about um how uh, and he's in the space force and oh, so okay. he wrote this and he's been at the white house or to the white house in the last few years talking about this and pushing pushing bitcoin and the whole thing is hmm. about bitcoin and how bitcoin is going to be the new um, and this is where we're kind of coming full circle. This is where people have had this problem with linking firearms and Bitcoin because of the munitions uh, and the encryption stuff back in the nineties and the original cypherpunk era. And, and we won, you know, people won that right. and right. So like we, it wasn't munitions anymore. Code is free speech. And so there's right. been this, you know, big one, a two A like not battle, but it's been like, you know, within the Bitcoin community where it's like, you know, people are like, well, don't call it. Don't call it, you know, uh, an offensive weapon. Like that's not not what Bitcoin oh, is. It's you know, actually, I, now that you say it, I, I haven't read it, but I I remember hearing about uh, mm -hmm. about his his thesis or article, whatever you call it. And yeah, I mean, that that's that's also a funny thing that happens in the gun in the gun space. You have people who are, you know, well, don't don't call an AR-15 an assault weapon. You know, don't call it a machine gun. You know, don't call it a weapon of war because you're letting the, the other side win. And it's like, well, I don't do it. It is a fucking weapon. That's why I have one <laughs> in case I need to go to war. And so that's evolved into now we have the 3D printing community. And so that's the, you know, code is free speech. And that was uh, what it was great for me a couple of years ago. I went to the Guns and Bitcoin conference in Miami, um, you know, got to meet the guys at Samurai Wallet and Ronin and, and, that that was really kind of the what made it all come together in my head is, you know, we have all these, um, you know, ITAR is the the law that restricts the proliferation of munitions technology, and so, um, you know, the State Department has been trying to go after the three D printing industry, saying, you know, you can't put these files on the internet because theoretically, some guy in China or Afghanistan or some country that's on the the non proliferation list could download that file and now you've committed an ITAR violation. And so going back to Bitcoin and as you said, you know, ciphers and, and um, you know, sort of like internet protocol security, um, you know, the harder it is for them to crack something, the more you can say whatever the fuck you want and lock it up somewhere and have it be completely unreadable. And the government does really see that the same way that they would view you owning a grenade or, um, you know, some kind of explosive device. That's the way that they want people to view it. And that's the way that I think that they view Bitcoin is, you know, anything that anything that can get 
around the government's ability to restrict what you can do or say they view as essentially a weapon. And so, yeah, um, ciphers and code is the same thing as an AR. You know, I, I, that's what I tell people to think about Bitcoin as a as a digital AR-15, right? So, like at the end of the day, the government you can say you, you got to take this gun from my cold dead hands. Okay, so then what are your choices? You can go buried in the yard, or you can have them come literally kill you and take your AR-15 from your cold dead hands. But then you're dead, and they have your AR-15. But in the world of Bitcoin, you know, as long as you can remember 12 words in your head, they can literally beat you to death and they will never get your Bitcoin. And if you if you are headstrong enough to be able to resist that and say, you know what, I'm going to take this Bitcoin to my grave. Fuck you guys. Um, even if you kill me, you're not going to get it from me. So it is what it is. I, to me, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I wish I had a digital AR-15 up in the clouds or something, you know, locked away in cold storage that I could just conjure up by typing 12 words into a keyboard and having my AR-15 appear in front of me. So that's the way that I see yeah. Bitcoin. And, you know, that that's what they that's what they fear the most. You know, objects in the physical world can be confiscated. They can be broken. They can be melted down. But things in the digital world, um, they can't do that with. And that's what I think the government fears probably more than anything. Where, where do you think that, I know we're getting towards the end here. Where, where did you, where do you think we went off these rails? Where going back to this, the anti-government thing, you know, where it's, it's just like, you know, you go back, I was reading my kids, the declaration of independence as their bedtime reading, uh, you know, a month yeah. ago during, you know, 4th of July week, which is, you know, what, uh, any good red, red blooded American should do. Right. Absolutely, and, right. you know, you're right. It's, and it's, it's right in there. You know, it's like the government works or at the consent of the governed, you know, like it's, it's so plain and so obvious right there. And that a six year old, five year old, seven year old can understand it. How, how have we gone this far off the rails where people are out there just clamoring for, for government and people to run their lives? I mean, it's so yeah. ass backwards. Make it I think I think it's one of the major issues is a simple competency problem for your average individual. So we've made it so easy to have we've more or less outsourced everything important in our lives to some somebody else or someplace else. And I grew up a little bit differently. You know, I'm, I'm in Novi, but um, back when I lived here when I was younger, it was a smaller city. Um, and my, my parents, we ha they have their own water well, they have their own septic system. My dad's an engineer, so he was always fixing stuff around the house. You know, if the septic pump broke, my dad was up uh, fixing the septic pump at, you know, 11 p.m. because we had to take a shower the next morning. But your average person that has city water and sewer and, you know, DoorDash and everything is provided. And so people just don't know your average person can't change the tire on their car, you know, and that's why cars these days, they don't even put spare tires in them anymore because nobody knows how to fucking use them. So I, I think that's a big problem is that the easier you make it for people to live their daily lives, the more they'll become reliant upon that and the, and the more resistant they will be to anybody trying to upset that balance. And so government has sort of installed itself as, well, you know, we will raise your kids by, you know, getting them into school as early as possible. You know, in Michigan, they want to feed your kids as well in school with this garbage food that, you know, you would you really shouldn't be even give, giving to prisoners, let alone kids but they tout it as, as this big win, you know, now, now mommy and daddy can both have uh, 60 hour a week jobs because, you know, you can just drop your kid off at 6 a.m. when he's four years old at pre-K and then, you know, come back at like 6 p.m. and um, we will have raised your kid for you and we will have fed your kid for you. And, you know, who knows, like, wh where do you go from there? Uh, you know, how, how do you install one more layer between uh, the child and the parents uh, as, as the government. So, you know, it's just one example, but I think that's the main problem is people are much less self-reliant now than, than they ever have been. And for sure, that's produced some great things for society. Like I'm not a Luddite, you know, I, I'm not gonna go live like Ted Kaczynski in a cabin or anything like that. I mean, there are some parts about that that sound glamorous to be sure, but you know, you can accept 
you know, I, I live in a modern house. Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I have apps on my phone, you know, like I, 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 uh, I, I fully embrace the modern world, but I do have solar panels. I have, you know, a battery backup. I have a generator system, all that stuff I installed myself because I wanted to learn how to do it. I wanted to know how it worked in case it breaks down. I don't have to call somebody to come and repair it. You know, I, I've always driven used cars and I find great deals. You know, you, you can buy some really cool, fast stuff if you're willing to do your own work. And not only do you have a lot more fun, but you you learn along the way. And now not only can I repair cars, but I can fix, you know, the broken uh, dishwasher. I can uh, repair something around the house uh, without having to call a repairman or, you know, buy, buy something brand new. So I think that's the biggest problem is people are, are just very accepting of the idea that government is here and they they have a solution and so we might as well just go with that and uh, not not try to reinvent anything of our own or try to learn how to do it ourselves and so you know the, but as we know there's no free lunch it's just like you know facebook and the social media apps they're not free uh they're free because they're getting your data and they're reselling your data to somebody else and that's how they're making revenue so there really is nothing for free, but people honestly do see government as like a free provider um, because you know your your taxes come out before you even see them. You know that uh, imagine imagine how it would be if every every week at the end of the week you had to actually go up to like some local you know the, the IRS office next to the DMV and you know cut them a check for the amount of taxes that you're paying. Um, after you've received it in your bank account. There, I think that would last all of a month and there'd be a, a civil war. <laughs> I think people would lose their minds, but it's just out of sight, out of mind. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I think it's probably not getting much better, but, you know, with the proliferation of technology, there are more people who are connecting that see it from the other side, that people are coming up with better solutions on their own and, you know, homeschooling kids is, is the new big thing. Obviously, there's um, been a lot of move toward um, finding better ways to do that, being able to connect small community groups to be able to share resources and produce a much better product than what the government can provide um, while being you know fully in control of what they're learning and, and things like that. So I think there's good strides in some areas, but it's an all encompassing problem. And I, Unfortunately, there, it's so embedded that right now there is no way around it. But I think the, the, the digitization of finance is a is a big step. I think that's not just a small stepping stone. That's that's going up three, you know, that's jumping up three, four steps on the staircase all at once, where when you control your own money, um, you have much more of an ability to make day to day decisions for yourself. And and uh, so I, I think the sooner that happens, the better. And, and that's, I think, going to wake a lot of people up who really haven't thought about it at all. So true. And it's, and you've outlined a case for, or against, I should say, for Bitcoin, for sound money against like a CBDC, you know, central bank digital currency, which right. is being implemented all around the world. They're trying to, you know, they're working on it here, obviously. And it makes me think of the Revolutionary War. It was a couple percent of people. Everyone thinks it's like, oh yeah, we're all. Everyone's just against the king, and like we're all just. It's like, yeah. no, it was a couple percent of no. people. Most people are British loyalists, and they were tattletailing on you, see something, say something, you know that. And there, and they were. It was only a couple percent, and then eventually it grew a little bit as the tide started turning. So I think that's the thing that you have to take solace in the the real freedom fighters, freedom minded people. Yeah. It's, it's going to be the couple of people in the foxhole, right? There's not going to be a whole, you know, throngs of people all, you know, storming the gates here. For sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, central bank digital currencies, you know, that's basically, you know, I, I could tell it's like, you know, so you're going to put the government in charge of there's, there's like one weapons manufacturer and it's the, the government uh, AR-15 company. And now you got to buy your AR-15 from the government. Like none of you would ever think that that was a good idea. Some of you, uh, stupidly thought that that was a good idea with uh, health insurance and healthcare, and you know, look how that's been going, and not just here, but most other places around the world. You know, look at the UK. I mean, it, it's a it's a nightmare. I mean, look at Canada. You know, you and I are not that far from Canada, and um, I talk to people all the time who have been on waiting lists for months to get an MRI that I could get in 20 minutes here if I wanted to. And yeah, I might have to pay a little bit for it, 
but it's gettable <laughs> and and I can go do it without having to ask anybody for permission. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot there for sure. There, there is, there, there, there really is. And it's, um, it, you know, like I said, you got to take solace and it's not going to, it, it was a naive, you know, 20 something or whatever. I just figured like, if people are going to wake up one day, they're just going to like ever, the whole country, like everyone's just going to wake up and like, this is so obvious. And it's just like, dude, no one it thinks it's obvious. No one cares. No one, like, you no. know, it's, it's not convenient. Right. Like none of these things are, you know, people just don't care until they're smoked in the face, uh, you know, 10 times or a hundred times. And then they, like we said, yeah. they finally realize you're in a fight, you know? So yeah, it's just wild. What, um, one or two little quick ones here before I wrap with the, yeah. Uh, a little thing with you that I want to be cognizant of your time here. What, um, what services, so what do you guys provide? I would love for you even to touch on, because I think this is, again, this is so unknown about, you know, gun owners or gun manufacturers and how, again, biased, you know, um, growing up being a hunter and being in this my entire life as well. It's, you know, how important gun safety is, right? And how that, that is the number one thing, the safety. And like you said, you training people, whether it's jujitsu or, or whether it is um, really anything, I mean, it could be working in your car and then you got it up on the hoist, yeah. right? It's always like safety comes first in all these sure. scenarios. And that's something like you said, if you're just outsourcing everything to the government and you have never held a firearm, you've never worked on a car, you've never had to do any of these things in your life. You just think it's like, oh no, that could like hurt me. So I get it away from me. I, I just right. ban it. And it's just so detached from reality. So I'd love for you to kind of touch on like what the services you guys provide, you know, the products, services, uh, and it could be anything. It could be the jujitsu, it could be things outside of, of Phoenix yeah. Ammunition as well. Yeah. But I'd love for you to kind of touch on that for a minute. Yeah. So Phoenix Ammunition, we, we, we're an ammunition manufacturer. So we assemble uh, ammo from component parts. Um, you could say that we're a, a very, very small version of like Ford Motor Company, for example. So Ford doesn't actually make any of the component parts mm -hmm. of a vehicle. What, but what Ford is selling you is the guarantee that the vehicle, that the parts were all perfect and that the vehicle was assembled perfectly uh, and, and is a, a functioning vehicle upon delivery. That, that's what Ford is guaranteeing. And we're kind of the same way. We don't make the component parts, but we are ensuring that all the component parts are good. Then we're putting them together perfectly. And then we're inspecting them afterward to make sure that it was in fact put together perfectly and that it's going to be there for you um, regardless of what you're buying it for competition um, basic training you know, self-defense we, you know we make ammunition for all of those uh, purposes so we are one of the only companies in the entire country that's able to inspect ammunition in an automated fashion at the rate of speed that we are doing it, which is something around 300 pieces per minute. And we're doing that with an array of 10 different lasers at every different angle. Uh, we're doing that with um, 10 different machine vision cameras that stitch together images from all the way around to make sure that we can, we can see dimensional tolerances down to two microns. Um, and that's not just the overall length of the cartridge, but we can see the length of the shoulder, the the neck taper, uh, the chamfer on the on the case rim, all of these small details, and we can reject a cartridge for missing any one of those details or for the the overall profile. So we're sort of on the cutting edge of you know the ammo industry, believe it or not, the gun industry really in general is not at all like the auto industry or the aerospace industry in terms of. Um, you may have heard of like ISO 9001 or uh, NADCAP. You know those are certifications for uh, record keeping to make sure that you're producing quality parts and that you know those parts uh, the records are kept for life and those things very common in, it means basically a requirement to work in the auto industry definitely a requirement for the aerospace industry not at all a requirement for the gun industry and the tolerances in this industry are so loose it would it would blow your mind and so Coming into it, again, being a little bit younger than most of the other established companies and looking to buy new equipment. And, you know, as we grew, we needed to expand our capabilities. So I put a lot of time into researching, you know, what's the latest and greatest? What, what can we do with machine vision now that we couldn't do 10, 15 years ago? And, you know, those companies are still trying to realize the return on investment on the equipment that they bought 10, 15 years ago when technology wasn't as good. We're re right here on the cutting edge. We have AI, you know, we have the ability to read, you know, character recognition and things. So let's try to do as much of that as we can so that we can get a jump ahead of everybody else. And so that's the direction that we went. So, um, you know, we're a small company, but we're very automated. Um, we, 
we think we have the best quality control of any ammunition manufacturer um, maybe in the world because we've spent our time trying to make sure that you know all the component parts are good uh, which is really not something that exists in this industry and then holding ourselves to a standard of you know every round has to be perfect um, you know as somebody who's been carrying a gun since he was 21 and was a consumer in this industry before um, you know I, I've put my life in the hands of other people uh, expecting their product to work and I've had good experiences and I've had bad experiences but now as a business owner in this world you know I don't I don't lie awake worrying at night that my product's going to end up you know being used by like some mass shooter that would obviously be horrible I, I hope that that never happens but really what keeps me awake at night is thinking that you know we may have put out a self-defense round in, into the world that isn't going to work when somebody needs it to and then that person ends up dying as a result you know i i would shut the company down i don't think i could live with that and I think that's the mentality that everybody in this industry should have, but unfortunately doesn't. Um, so that's kind of what we do on a product side. Um, as far as training and services, we don't do anything directly, but we've got a great partnership with um, Haley Strategic uh, Training. Um, if, you've, if you've heard of them, big name in the industry. Some of the, I, Personally, I think one of the best training companies that I've ever worked with. Uh, we, we work with another company here in Michigan called MDFI, Michigan Defensive Firearms Institute. Uh, we supply uh, instructor ammo to Warrior Poet Society. So um, while I would love to spend time, you know, teaching firearms uh, classes, I just don't have the time for it. But we've we've tried to network with the people who I think are the best at it. One thing that I do think I'm good at through years of combat sports, wrestling in college for a, a you know a top uh, Division One program. I'm very good at knowing who is a, a good instructor and a good teacher and who isn't. Um, I've been around some of the best coaches in, in the country, people who are now coaching Olympic athletes. And so I, I, it's easy for me to identify somebody who knows what they're talking about and is passionate about it and is able to communicate that information to somebody who's brand new or be able to communicate at least one little detail to somebody that's very advanced and you know get them to the next level in in some form or fashion and like we were talking about government earlier you know it was a wake-up call for me after having taken a cpl class and having carried a gun for many years without really any formal training you know go take a cpl class and tell me what you learn right you learn a bunch of dumb shit that you're never gonna you don't really care about in the real world and it certainly doesn't tell you like how to grip the gun or how to clear a malfunction or any of those things so you know, there's there's your example. I, I, I don't think that you should be required to take a class to get a CPL anyway. I know somebody's going to say that in the comments, like you shouldn't have to. I totally agree. But the point is, you know, in this state, at least you have to. And so the government, you know, the NRA created this curriculum and the government thinks that that's everything you need to go out and carry a gun in public. And it, and it just isn't. You know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it anyway. Uh, you know, do whatever you want. But if you think that you're going to be John Wick because you took a CPL class, uh, when the time comes, you're fucking wrong. It's just not going to work that way. And I learned that absolutely firsthand, you know, the first time I went to a three gun competition and shot with some people who had been shooting for a while. And I looked around and I said, dude, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I can't ever let that happen again. I need to get much better at this. And that got me personally into competitive shooting. And that in turn opened up a huge market for us. Uh, so, you know, it kind of all comes full circle, but, um, yeah, so on the training side, uh, that's, that's who we work with. I'm actually going to be going down to Ohio to train with, uh, Haley strategic for a couple of days, um, tonight, uh, uh, uh until Thursday. So they, they travel all around the country. Um, and, you know, like I said, we, we identified them as a company that we really wanted to work with because they, I think have one of the best teaching methodologies I've personally worked with and, and they're very, it's just a, a group of people who are passionate about, you know, their work, their life, their family, but protecting all those things. Uh, and I think that's a mentality in society that unfortunately is also dying. You know, the more you rely on other people to do things for you, um, the more you think it, maybe it's a good idea for you to outsource your uh, family's protection to somebody else. And to me, that's something that I'll never do. 
and something that you know you could never convince me is a good idea. Um, so we're we're trying to do as much as we can to you know even people in the gun industry or gun owners who I've had a gun forever. You know I've been hunting since I was a kid. I can shoot the wings off of a fly at you know 400 yards. I go okay. Well, that's cool. You ever taken a formal firearms class? Oh, no, no, no. I don't need any of that stuff. You know, grandpappy taught me how to shoot. It's like, okay, well, good luck. I hope so. I mean, maybe he did. Um, maybe your grandfather's Carlos Hathcock or something. And, and you know, you had the best uh, gun education that anybody's ever had, but probably not. And, and if you think you can tell the difference, you probably can't uh, unless you've, you know, gone out and seen it. For yourself in person so um you know i'm a i'm a big believer that anybody should be able to carry a gun outside of you know the most extreme of extreme you know public dangers people that are are or should be in prison you know or, or a mental asylum those kinds of things but i'm also cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of people who carry a gun that think they're much more well trained than what they are and i hope those people come around to it and um, better the community by bettering themselves. And, you know, that will also help us fight back against the people on the left who try to paint gun owners as a bunch of, you know, Elmer Fudd uh, idiots uh, who, you know, are, are a danger to society or a danger to other people. Um, some of that we're never going to be able to get rid of, but I think some of that we could defeat on our own by making firearms training cool and mainstream. You know, if we could get some of these big name celebrities to come out and do a firearms training class with Haley Strategic. I mean, that, that's sort of what Terran Tactical was trying to do uh, with, with uh, you know, actors and, and Hollywood um, over the last few years. But I think we need to, to have that at a much larger level. And I think you need to have those people also out there training with your average everyday guy who's probably a much better shooter uh, and has been doing this a lot longer um, and get those crowds to intermingle and mix with each other. Um, I think, I think that's really what needs to happen to, to take it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. I so well said, I could not agree more. Where do you, do you guys ship all over the country? Where do you guys ship to? Yeah. So we, we can ship, we let's put it this way. We ship everywhere. We're legally allowed to ship to. Um, <laughs> so we can ship to basically every state except for the ones that you would expect, not like California um, you know, some of them present a logistical challenge, like we, we could theoretically sell to Alaska, but it would have to go by air and you can't send ammo by air. So we can't ship to Alaska. Um, same yeah. problem with Hawaii. Um, so there's a couple of states that we, we just can't ship to regardless. California, we technically can, but it has to go to a dealer and they have to do a background check to buy fucking ammo in California. It's crazy. So that's kind of a non-starter, but you know there have been a couple of weeks where there were Supreme Court decisions or, or circuit court decisions that allowed us for like a week or two to be able to ship to California, and you fucking better believe we did. I mean, we we took every order we possibly could, and then some. Uh, so we're always looking for those opportunities to get around it when we can. Wow, that is that is remarkable. All right, last last two little things. We've got a quick word game sponsored by my our company, my company, Bitcoin Trading Cards. So, um, mm. collectible cards that educate people on all the things we just talked about: Bill of Rights, <laughs> Sound Money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A little word association. Then I'm have a, a little question that I want you to uh, sure. give for the for the next person. So I'm just gonna run. I have like 15 words, just like a lightning round. Run through them. Okay. And whatever, so the first thing that comes to my head is that the idea. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes, sir. Satoshi Nakamoto. <sighs> Profit. Mm. Family. Patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> there, now we're coming full circle with the memes. Elon Musk. Founding father. The NRA. Outdated. Mm. Combat sports. <sighs> uh, see, so yeah, like, how do I put this in one word? Uh, <laughs> it can be more than one. Yeah. Um, 
the original Olympic sport. Mm, I like that. Faith. Acceptance. Memes. Civilian propaganda. <laughs> World Economic Forum. <laughs> uh what's the uh what's the name of that james bond group uh specter <laughs> that, I, I, yeah. I like it the bill of rights maslow's hierarchy of needs mm. community shared ideals like it central bank digital currencies The end of free speech. <laughs> Bitcoin trading cards. Bitcoin trading cards. Uh, uh, magic for grownups. <laughs> Ooh, I like it. And finally, Phoenix ammunition. Based. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, you pa you passed. You passed that, that test, that pop quiz. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> last thing is I want you to a question. I would love for you to ask a question for the next guest. I'm actually, this is, you're the first one I'm doing it with. We're 70 episodes okay. in. But going forward, I want, I figured you are a good person to actually do this with. So um, a, a question, it can be whatever you want. It could be political. It could be about Bitcoin. It could be about firearms. It could be about you name it, family, homeschooling, growing up, whatever. Um, a question for the next guest to ask for the, for this last segment of the end of the next show. Good question. Um, so I'll try, try to keep it maybe like Bitcoin and, and politics related. Um, yeah. Let's see. I would I would be interested to know what uh, the Bitcoin world would think about countries like, you know, Russia or some of these other countries that we prevent from using um, most of the world banking system. Um, what uh, what would they think about those countries? pushing Bitcoin and ultimately that being the thing that makes Bitcoin the, the thing. Uh, would they be okay with that? Would they see that as a net positive for the world? Or would they be, would, would, would they not want the messenger to be somebody that they don't particularly like um, for various other reasons? I it's kind of an interesting thing to think about because, you know, that's yes. something I've been thinking about quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, the more that we push sanctions on other countries, the more that they're going to have to find ways around basically the U.S. banking system, which is the world banking system. And so we may inadvertently cause, um, you know, a, a digital currency of some sort, Bitcoin, what have you, to become the thing uh, as a result of backlash against the things that we're doing uh, as far as um, banking sanctions. And, and I wonder how people will perceive that, you know, if they'll try to say, well, Putin is a Bitcoin guy, so that's why we have to, you know, stop uh, Bitcoin or Kim Jong-un or, you know, pick your dictator of the day. Uh, 100%. You know. 100%. I, I love it. <laughs> I love it. You're the first person I've been doing the game for a while now for like last like 30 episodes, but that was, you're the first one did the question for, and that yeah. is the one question that doesn't get talked about. And that's the one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately of yeah. like, I don't think anyone in the Bitcoin community is really ready. Like, Oh, Bitcoin's for your enemies. It's like, yeah. yeah what happens when it actually is your enemies? It just, is. they're the only right. ones buying Bitcoin. Right. What happens? What, what are y'all going to think? <laughs> that's yeah. wild. Absolutely wild. Yeah, I love it's it. interesting to think about. And like I said, you know, the, the more you make something illegal, the more people who are already bad people are going to do it. Uh, so, you know, if you don't think that that's happening, uh, then you're crazy. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Well, wow. Where, where can people find you? What a way to wait a way to what a way to end. Where can people find you? Yeah. Uh, they can find us directly on our website, uh, phoenixammo.com, or they can find us on Twitter uh, at Phoenix Ammunition. That's our only social media. We're uh, nowhere else, but uh, you can reach us in both of those places. 
And uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to, to have you as part of our cadre. And uh, we'd love to see you out on the range. Beautiful stuff, Mr. Justin Nazaroff. Thank you so much for being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Justin Nazaroff of Phoenix Ammunition. This is definitely something a little outside the box. And if you like other videos that are a little bit outside the box and to see what other people answer in their questions that they ask a future guest, go check out this interview I just did with Max Kaiser directly after Donald Trump spoke at the Bitcoin conference. We sat in some beautiful lounge chairs, sat there for 40 minutes. He calls me out. He calls my cameraman out. He talks price prediction. Is Bitcoin sent by God? How we find out who Satoshi is? You're not going to want to miss that interview. It's the most base, authentic interview I've ever seen with Max Kaiser. Or in the past month, we interviewed Jeff Booth as well here on Playable Characters. You're not going to want to miss that. He talks unbelievable price predictions going forward, AI, 3D printing, and how Bitcoin takes that all to a level we have never seen before. Thank you for watching Playable Characters.